at the end of every year, you, you look back at 2013, and you start looking at things that really went well, and you can look back at things that didn't go quite so well. And you look back and you see on the magazines the men of the year, the woman of the year, and you look at things that the year represented. And we can all look at our lives and you look at something new, something fresh. On your chair in front of you, there's a card. It's our new sermon series called New. New. Happy New Year. The word new gives an idea of freshness, an idea of I get to do something new. I get to do something over. I get to do something fresh, a fresh start. So when you're thinking about the idea of 2014, the next season of life, when you think about seasons as we change, as we wake up this morning to a, to a snowstorm and you automatically know, well, a season has changed. We are now definitely in a winter season. In order for seasons to change, things have to occur. And sometimes they occur through storms. Sometimes they're very subtle, but the seasons always change. And I want to give you a couple principles about a season of change. In order to enter a new season, we must often be stripped of the last season. In order for God to do something great in the next phase of your life, we have to be stripped of the last phase within your life. Because what happens is we become so accustomed to where we are, we won't let go and let God do something great in our future. We are so caught in the past, we don't allow God to move into the future. We have to be stripped or made to let go of the last season of our life. Because God wants to prepare us for the very next phase within our life. And he cannot prepare us until he strips us from the past. And the second thing is comparison of a new season in someone else's life to your life can be very fatal. Just because somebody else is experiencing something that you're not experiencing, or just because they have something that maybe you do not have, doesn't mean that God doesn't love you it means he's preparing you for the next blessing. So we look at comparison. We look at what others may go through or what others may have or the freedom that they have or the, maybe the blessings that God has given to them. And we feel sometimes that God doesn't love us or bless us enough because God is blessing and loving somebody else. And we have to remember it is, it is fatal for comparison. We cannot compare our lives our ministries, our wealth, or even God's blessing compared to someone else, we have to allow God to work with us individually. And the future sometimes is clear to God, but it's very fuzzy to us. You know, when we turn the page into 2014, we are all saying, man, I hope we have a good year. I hope 2014 is better than 2013. And when you look at that, our future is fuzzy, but God, through his wisdom and his lens, is not a fuzzy future. God has it in store for us, and we can just trust in him. So when we look at the phases of life or the seasons of life, we have to remember that God is in complete control. Now, there's a scripture I want to read. It's found in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, when you look at uh, resolutions, and you think about what you want to accomplish, what you want to do something better or bigger in 2014, or something that you have to experience and you're looking forward to maybe an event, maybe something that's happening within your life that you're just thrilled to death that's taking place. And you want to look at that. And the Bible says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. As we look into the future, we have to be understanding that God's will can be accomplished within your life. So when you look at that scripture, I have three things I want to share with you. Number one, our time on this earth is very limited. 
Our time is limited. In the verse in uh, Psalms chapter 39, verse 4, it says, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. How fleeting is my life. When, you, when you're 16, 17, 18 years of age and, and you think the whole world is in front of you, and then you look back when you're 50 or 60 years old and you think, where did everything go? How, I, I, I missed something. Did I, did I go to sleep and like 10 years pass by? It's fleeting. We look back and we grow and we experience life. And at the moment, we don't understand how fleeting our life is. But when we look back at what we have or what we have done, what we have to understand is our life is very fleeting. So what we have to do in that fleeting life is live our life well. And the Bible also says, full of wisdom. Full of wisdom. And if our time on this earth is limited, I think we should be very wise in how we live our life and what we do within our life. Now, there are some things that are very important to us. And, and they're called, they're called, they are called heartfelt needs. And in our life, in the decisions that we make, if we can boil our life with wisdom on these four heartfelt needs, we will close our life with a smile on our face, knowing that we've done what God wanted us to do. Number first, number one is acceptance. Knowing you are loved. We have to feel accepted. We have to feel we are loved. If we feel we are loved, if we feel that somebody has come alongside us and I know that I'm loved, I know that I'm accepted, I know that, that I'm living my life for someone else and somebody else loves me in their life, we feel accepted when we can go through life and know that I'm accepted for who I am and I can be loved for who I am. That gives us confidence and a heartfelt need of assurance. The first one is acceptance. We all need to feel accepted. The second one is identity. Knowing that you are significant. I have an identity. When I know that I have an identity, when I can be myself, when I can walk into a room, or you could walk into a room, and you don't have to put on the facade, you don't have to play the game, you can be yourself. And when you can be yourself and you have that identity that you know that you're a child of God and you don't have to be ashamed of who you are, you can be who God created you to be. You have an identity. And when we live our life with acceptance and with an identity that I am who I am and God created me to be who I am and I can use the gifts that God has given to me, I have an identity that I am secure. And that's awesome. The third one is security. Security. Knowing that everything is going to be okay. When we have a heartfelt need and we feel insecure, anxieties rise up within us. Our fears rise up within us. And so we are so fearful of our past that we're afraid of what we've done. We become so highly, have high anxieties of the future so I, I, I can't live in the past because of my fears. I can't live in the future because of my anxieties. I'm stuck in the present and I'm petrified because I don't know what to do. I have to have security. And the only way a child of God with a heartfelt need can have security is trust in God. As, Ju as uh, Justin said, put on the whole armor of God. And when you fight and after you're done with everything you have, stand. You don't have to do anything else. Put on the armor of God. Know you're doing what God wants you to do and stand and fight because you know that you're a child of God. When I have security, I know everything is going to work out. I put on God's armor. I do what God wants me to do. And the heartfelt need of all of us is to say, it'll be okay. At the end of the fight, at the end of my life, when the kids finally get raised, they finally get married, they finally get out of the house, it will be okay. You've done your job. We've raised our children. We've done what we have call, been called to do. It will be okay, security. And I believe the biggest heartfelt need is purpose. Purpose. Knowing that there's a real reason for my life. You know, most people go through life wondering this one thing. What is my purpose? What am I here to do? 
Am I here just to go to work and make money and to buy a house and drive a car? Shouldn't I have a deeper, more purposeful meaning to my life? And the greatest wisdom that we can give from God is this. We have a purpose. Knowing that there's a real purpose within my life and live my life accordingly to that purpose. Find out what God's will is for our life and live our life pleasing to him. When our time is limited on this earth, we must know that there are four heartfelt needs that we live our life through. The first is acceptance. The second is identity. The third is security. And the fourth is purpose. And then we go to this. Make the most of every opportunity. If our time is short, we must make the most out of every opportunity. When we look at the word opportunity, it means, it means every issue, every opportunity that walks within our door, we must be wise in how we handle that opportunity because that opportunity is a growing point within our life. Jesus said that Satan is a robber and he's a thief and he wants to destroy and deceive you. So when Jesus tells us to take every opportunity under God's hand, Satan says he's a thief and a robber. The two are fighting with each other. How do we know what he wants to do? I believe that one of the things that Satan does in our lives, in my life, is he just, he just cram packs my life full. Time, energy, I just get so busy doing things, I don't have time to schedule the things that I need to do. So I cannot take every opportunity that God gives to me because I'm so busy doing, I can't think about what God truly wants me to do. So I found this. In your Bible, you would see that there are margins. We all took English class and we all understand what margins are. So I, read, I, want, I found this and I want to read this to you today. When you read a book or write a paper, that are the margins. Margins are two things. They are places of separate, they separate something from nothing. No book or report would look good if we were filled with words on the entire page. Margins create a sense of space. The other thing margins do is establish the guidelines for the print. Print does not go beyond the margins. And then it says this. I wonder how many people here at Glenville right now who call themselves Christ followers, who are sincerely desired to do what Jesus would have them to do, but don't have any margins in their lives and therefore cannot do it. Our lives are going from left to right, top to bottom, full, and God is saying, I need some space. There's, there's reasons why your life is in shambles is because you put no space for me. We're so busy doing, we do not have time to do the things that God wants us to do. So I believe the margins are very important. Their entire lives are packed with commitments and responsibilities. There's no blank space. Their lives are overcluttered messes like pages without margins. And if that's the case, I want to list five things that I think we need to look at our margins. Number one is time. Do we fill our life up so much that we don't have time. We don't have time to talk. We are so busy doing that we don't have time to allow God to put opportunities within our life to do what God wants us to do. We are so full. We are so busy that we don't have time for God to allow opportunities within our life. And then relationships. Sometimes we are so full of relationships Sometimes good relationships and sometimes bad relationships. But sometimes we are so full of relationships that we are overcommitted in what God wants us to do. And God always, always does the supernatural thing by bringing people into our life for us to minister to them and to give them the opportunity to give their life to Christ. But if our life is so full that we do not allow God to bring new relationships in, new people into our life, 
and we have to say no to any other relationship, so I can't handle anymore, how can God use your pain and your, and your testimony to bring a relationship in to share Jesus Christ with somebody else? Sometimes we are so full, but what God wants to do is put the margins in so I can take every opportunity to put people within your life that I can change. And then commitments. Sometimes we are just way overcommitted. We are way overcommitted. And you know what they'll say is, if you're way overcommitted, guess what you're going to be? You're going to be committed. Sometimes we just, we are crazy with our commitments. And we drive ourselves crazy because we cannot live up to our commitments. We look at our calendar, our phones go off every 30 minutes because we have another appointment, we have another meeting, we have to be someplace, we have this to do, this to do, this to do, and all of a sudden we wake up early in the morning, we go to bed at night, and all we have done is had commitments. And commitments, we need to put margins in our life with the commitments. We need to reevaluate our commitment level. Commitments are just like dollar bills. And we know how... Say, say that you had $100 to spend for the week. And you went through, and, and you know if you have 100 bucks, how much you're going to spend on this and that and what you want to do. You don't go on the first day of the week, and you spend 60 bucks, and now you have 40 bucks. And now it's at the end of the week, and now you're down to five or six bucks. And now the kids want to go do something. You say, I, I don't have any money. We can understand that financially. We can understand that with money. But the same exact thing is time, commitment, is our commodity in order for us to have a life. But sometimes we overextend our commitment, so what is left over, we have no energy left. We have no, we have no time to fulfill our commitments to God because we've already filled all of our schedule up with other commitments. And then uh, financially. I think we're totally strapped financially. And I think that the reasons why we can't do what God wants us to do is we've strapped ourselves financially and we go into debt just to have something. And God said this, my principles are not your principles. If you do not live by my principles, you will not have a successful financial future. So I believe the reason why people are going through life with no resources at hand is because their life, their, their marriage, their family is wrapped up in their margins. They, they buy, they sell, they have, and they fill their stuff up to buy stuff. And they look at their life at the end and they look at their life and they have no resources. They're living through debt because their margins of their life financially is absolutely full. And what we have to do is we have to look at our life and we have to shrink down the margins of our life financially. And we have to look at it and say, what is the priority? What does God want me to do? And sometimes God forces us to do that. He forces us to look at our budgets. He forces us to look at our life. And he says this. He says, I want you to be successful. But my priority is not for you to have things. It's for you to have joy and satisfaction and contentment. But we spend all of our life trying to buy satisfaction and contentment. And we cannot buy something that only God can give. But yet financially, we leave God completely out and expect for us to buy our happiness and our joy and our contentment. And we can't do it. We've tried it. Our houses are full, our garages are full, our storage units are full, our basements are full, our attics are full of stuff that we don't even know we have, but we bought thinking it was going to give me joy. And it doesn't give us joy. It may give us satisfaction for a moment, but what God is saying to us, stuff, it's not important. What's important is if you give your life, your soul, your commitments to me and allow me to walk through you financially. You don't have to live in debt. You don't have to live above your means. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. You can be who you are. Security, identity, purpose. You don't have to be somebody else. Be happy with who you are. And if you are happy with who you are, whether you live in a mobile home or you live in a condo or you have a 10 bedroom house, it doesn't change the fact that God loves you. That's who you are. 
And financially, we need to make sure that we have margins within our family life and within our personal life. And then sometimes the last one is games and hobbies. Sometimes we just play the game and we're so busy playing that we don't have time to put God where he wants us to go. And I'm so guilty of that, that, you know, I, I love, you know, NFL season and I'm preaching to the choir here, my, um, you know, playoffs here, March Madness is right around the corner. And, you know, I, I just get into all that stuff and I absolutely get addicted to the NFL playoffs and get addicted to basketball. Shockers playing at one o'clock today and we're going to do all our stuff. But, you know, sometimes we have to make sure that we do not play so much that we don't put God where he needs to be. We need to put it in the margins that we need to have. There's a story when Jesus was eating, um, uh, Martha and Mary were at the house. And uh, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha was so busy cooking dinner and preparing and cleaning. Martha got mad at Mary. And Martha got so mad at Mary, she even said, Jesus, why don't you do something about this woman? I'm up here serving you. I'm up here doing things for you. I'm up here making sure everything's taken care of. And Mary is just sitting listening to you. And the analogy is so important. Sometimes we get so busy doing, we lose sight of what we are doing. And so often in our life, we get so busy serving, doing, and trying to accomplish, we lose sight of who we're trying to serve. And Mary was at the very feet of Jesus, listening to the heart of God. And Jesus said this to Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, Martha. Mar Mary has chosen the wise, the intelligent, the better thing. There's nothing wrong with you serving. But don't get mad at somebody that's worshiping. Don't get mad at somebody that's learning. Everybody's in a different phase of life. We cannot be so committed and overcommitted that we do not have time to do what God truly wants us to do. Richard Swenson wrote this book called Overload. And he said America is in what he calls overload. He lists four things that we are in overload about. We are overloaded with commitments. We are overloaded with possessions. Thirdly, we are overloaded in the area of work. And we are at the information overload. We are so busy trying to learn, trying to have, trying to do, trying to become, we lose sight of why we are working, what we are doing. We need to have a new, fresh perspective of what does God truly want in 2014. If we take everything from 2013, bring it into 2014, add all the 2014, we are going to be so busy trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to keep up with everything, we are going to just be exhausted. We have to leave some things behind. We have to say no to certain things. We have to shut certain doors and lock those doors and leave some of that stuff behind us in 2013. Because if we don't, we will never have the opportunities that God wants us to have in 2014. Now, I don't know what you need to leave behind. You do. You know those things that are handcuffing you to the past. You know those things that you feel like you're going over and over and over and doing the same stuff every time. You know what those things are. And the Bible says, uh, Paul tells, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish. In other words, don't, don't stick your head in the sand. Don't think it's going to be okay. Don't act as if everything's going to be okay. There's some times in my life and in your life that we have to get out of the ostrich mindset and get our head up and look around and say, if I do not make changes, I will never be successful in this area, in my area, whatever that would be. So my challenge to start new and start fresh is we need to leave some things behind. And on the card in your chair. That card is not for me. That card is for you. I listed some things that I think we need to do, and I think those things are very important. Let's, let's read those things real quick. The, dairy, the new year, enough happiness to keep you sweet, but enough trials to keep you strong, enough sorrow to keep you human, enough hope to keep you happy, 
enough failure to keep you humble, enough success to keep you eager, enough friends to give you comfort, enough wealth to meet your needs, enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow, and enough determination to make each day better than the day before. And in Romans chapter 13, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than what it first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. The idea that we have is we have to have the list of priorities within our life that God can do great things. I am a firm believer. I believe our churches, I believe our families, and I believe our resources have been stagnated because of our past. Because of things that we have done, because commitments that we have been given, and because relationships that we have um, we have, have that maybe overload us, we need to cast off some things. We need to leave some things behind in 2013. Because when you look at what do you desire? Redeeming the times. Looking forward to God's hand upon your life. God wants to do great things. He wants to change the very outcome of your life. He wants to give you that inner joy, that inner peace, that inner satisfaction. But in order to get what God wants for you, we can't have so many anxieties of the future because of our fears of where we were. We have to say no. We have to ask God to forgive. We have to be willing to stick up and say, you know what, this is not working. This does not give me happiness. This does not give me satisfaction. What I want is something new. And in order to do something new, I have to be willing to try something new. I have to be willing to go out on the rope, to go out on the ledge, to go out and try to do something that's fun. Uh, we went canoeing just a few months ago. And, uh, you know, one of the funnest things about canoeing is you, you go canoe down the road and all of a sudden you, you're at the bank and you see a rope on the side of a tree. And all these guys, these young bucks out there, they climb up that tree and they get up on that rope and they swing that rope out there and they do a flip and they land in the water. And, you know, that's pretty fun. But I'm 50 years old, a little overweight. And I, first thing I'm thinking is, I don't think the rope's going to hold me, you know, number one. I, but I had to have trust that I could do that. I had to fight a fear that, you know what? I'm not going to let these young guys see that I'm scared to death. I am going to do this. So I climbed up that tree and I grabbed that rope with fear and trembling in my soul. I launched off that thing and I, I landed. And I mean, there was no water in the lake after I got done, but I landed. And you know, they laughed. It was fun. But you know what? That sounds so simple. But you know, when you have a fear, number one, fear of heights, fear of embarrassment that you know that's kind of scary isn't it but you know what once I got in there and I did it the first time I said what get out of the way I want to do that again because once you have success of something that you're fearful in it gives you gratification because what did you do you had success and you conquered your fears and once you conquer your fear you can look at something with bold determination and say that is not in front of me any longer. I am going to wipe that clean. I am going to be successful at that. I am not going to be held back to what scared me in the past. I'm going to open the door to what God wants in the future. So the thing that is holding you back, the thing that you have fear and trembling about, the thing in 2013 that you said, I just sick and tired. I'm tired of this. I want to get rid of it. I have to do something different. Say it, claim it, write it on that card, and put a focus that that 2013 is behind me. And on 2014, I am going to strive to do what God wants me to do. And I'm going to strive to do it with a bold determination that God 
has the ability because he created me to be who I am. I have the heartfelt needs delivered by God. I have the ambition by God. I have the liberty within Christ. I am going to be successful because I'm going to say no to the past. Yes to God's blessing in 2014. Not only am I just going to thank it, I need you to write it. There's something about visually, physically, writing down the thing that you need to give up because you are sticking your head out of the sand, looking around, understanding, I have to do this, and if I do this, I am going to receive the future that God has in store for me and write it. Write it down. What do you desire? What do you have to focus on? What will you have to change? And write it down. Put it in your purse. Put it in your dresser at the house. Put it someplace where when you look at that, you can look at the very first Sunday of January in 2014, I locked the door. I said, I'm not going to be conquered by that any longer. And I'm going to open a door for God's blessing and God's purpose in 2014. New. Something fresh. Something new. An opportunity. All month long, we're going to take this simple word, new, and look at different aspects of our life, our church, and what we can do. You know, one of the greatest things that we can do is start something new. Um, right, Glenville is teaming up with a ministry called Right Now Ministries. And at the end of January, each and every church member will have an access code. And that access code, you can go online to Right Now Ministries and have an access code. There are going to be hundreds of Bible studies, hundreds of leadership conferences, hundreds of children's Christian videos, hundreds of, of like Netflix videos Christian perspective. You can go online and you can spend all night, all day long looking at Bible studies, studying the truth, having Christian videos for your kids to watch. And it's going to be completely free to you. Why is that? Because I believe the greatest tool that Satan uses is the deception. Getting so busy doing the things that you want that we do not put God where he needs to be. And if we as a church can give you the tools to, to study, to learn, to entertain your children in a godly environment, what that does, it just grows our church because it grows our family. So at the end of January, the entire church, you're going to have a library of thousands of tools, whether it's video, whether it's leadership conferences, whether it's Bible studies, whether it's women's meetings, whether it's videos, whether it's tapes, whether it's books, you're going to be able to put an access code in and go wherever you want to go and learn everything that God wants you to learn completely free. I believe the greatest tool we have is getting our head out of the sand and saying, you know what? I, I, Bruce Thomas, I cannot be satisfied with where I am. I need to learn, I need to grow, and I need to trust in God that he is going to take me into the future and not leave me in the past. I'm done with 2013. I am excited what God is going to do with us, through us, in our community, and in our church in 2014. The key word is new. We have to do something new, something fresh, something exciting, something that's going to liberate us, and it's going to change our community. The word new is a fresh word. Happy new year. It's not happy old year. It's not happy redundant year. Fresh and new. Let's have a great new year. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your love and your guidance within our life. And I pray right now that you'll just be with us. Be with every aspect. I pray you'll be with us as we look at this new series, this new year. 2014 will be such an awesome opportunity for our church to grow not only numerically, but also spiritually and in wisdom, in the abilities to do fresh and new things. Let us never be the same as we were in the past. Please open our hearts, open our lives, open our opportunities so we can redeem this time for you. 
And we can be the church you want us to be. And we can be the Christian you want us to be. We can be the family that you want us to be. And the individual that you want us to be. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Al.